Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we will call to order, please. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have a quorum? Councillors, could I ask you to sign in, please? Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. Okay, so first up we have committee of the whole closed meeting. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Holland, that council resolve itself into the committee of the whole closed meeting to consider the following items. Labor relations or employee negotiations, Kingston Professional Firefighters Association Local 498, negotiated settlement, and B, labor relations or employee negotiations, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 636, negotiated settlement. Please vote. And that carries. Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego ani buju wachaya kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who are entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting uh, in committee of the whole closed meeting. We discussed a couple of items uh, with respect to labor relations, uh, one with respect to the Kingston Professional Firefighters Association and one with respect to the International Brotherhood of Electrical Works. So at this point, I will ask for a motion to waive the rules and have the clerk report, please. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, that council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting and that the rules of bylaw number 2010-1 be waived in the city clerk report. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Shell, that Council ratify the collective agreement and authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the agreement between the Corporation of the City of Kingston and the Kingston Professional Firefighters Association, Local 498, for the period January 1, 2018 to December 31, 2019. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that Council ratify the collective agreement and authorize the Mayor and Clerk to execute the agreement between the Corporation of the City of Kingston and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 636, for the period January 1, 2018 to December 31, 2019. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, next we have the approval of the adeds. Uh, we have an additional delegation, a report from the nominations advisory committee, and uh, some communications. Can I have a mover for the adeds, please? Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanic. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, 
Seeing none, uh, we have no presentations this evening, but we do have a couple of delegations. First, uh, Michel Dubois, Executive Director, the Association Canadienne Francaise de l'Ontario, Conseil Régional des Mille Îles, ACFOMI, and Erica Lemon, Office Agent ACFOMI, will appear before Council to speak to Clause 6 of Report Number 28 received from the CAO with respect to the Bonjour Welcome Campaign. Up. And just a note for all of our delegations that you have five minutes. Bonjour, welcome. This is a campaign we are, we are launching in Kingston. Uh, we are the French Canadian Association of uh, the Thousand Islands, the ACFOMI which is known from, by ACFOMI, the acronym in Kingston. Our mission is to promote and ensure the integration, participation, and representation of the French-speaking community in the Thousand Island region and uh, Kingston, and to ensure its continuity. We offer employment services, immigration services, and French language speaking services. Uh, we are launching now today the uh, Bonjour Welcome campaign uh, with the AFO, the Assembly of the Francophonie of Ontario. The organization represents uh, the French speaking community all throughout Ontario and advocates for linguistic rights uh, for the Francophone with the Ontario Parliament. Uh, so we are doing the Bonjour Welcome campaign in partnership uh, with the FO, and there's a website, bonjourwelcome.ca. I will let my uh, <laughs> community liaison agent, Erika, to explain what is the campaign about. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yes, so I've been leading the campaign since, since I was hired at ECFAMI um, in late December as the community liaison agent. And um, so we've been reaching out to a lot of different um, employers, so different uh, employers in different organizations and businesses. Um, and the, the first part of the campaign is to really ask for the Francophone or for Francophile community to ask for those, um, those services that they need. And um, the second part of it is to ask businesses and organizations to show um, that they have those services or when they have them because we know that sometimes it's not possible for for those people to have those services um, like 24 7 so um, that was a really big thing about the campaign and um, at the very basis we um, the the main like mission that this campaign has is to just be welcoming so really it's um it's very good for the tourists like we um we spoke to a uh, Chris Wyman from the Visitor Center in Kingston, and he said that he has over 40% um, tourists that are francophone that come in in the summer. So we know that um, there's a need, not just in our community, but in the people who um, really come in and out of it. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for uh, for having us. We just came back from our launch right now. So uh, it ended at 7 p.m., so we got to walk right over and present. So thank you so much. So uh, we're just going to explain uh, what uh, we would like from the city council would like to, you the city council to uh, embark in the campaign and uh, promote uh, the bonjour welcome campaign and uh, be able to offer french services in the city of kingston whenever it's possible so we would just like you to be able to uh, put our uh, logo and our uh, promotional um, material to uh, be welcoming the Fran Francophone community whenever they need uh, French um, services, whenever it's possible. We don't want to demand it, we just want to say, why not do it when it's possible? There's a lot of people speaking French in Kingston, so if it's possible, why not offering this, the services in French? So we would just like the City Council to uh, support our campaign. Yes, and um, should you wish to have any more information on it, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our coordinates, coordinates are at the bottom. So you all have the, our coordinates mm -hmm. in the bottom, so you can reach us whenever you feel like. That's it. Okay. Thank you very thank, much. Thank, thank you. you. Are there any questions? Councillor Neal. Yes, sounds like a really good initiative. Uh, have you had an opportunity to talk to Keys or Kingston Immigration Services uh, groups? Because I know that they reach out and assist, uh, and we have quite a few immigrants that are uh, primarily francophone. So if you haven't yet, I strongly suggest yes, reaching uh, the, out to them. 
They, they have not joined our campaign yet. We are launching it, so we will work to get more and more people. We have already 17 organizations and business that have joined uh, as of today. But we really work with Keys and Kingston Migration Partnership every day because we are an employment service and immigration service provider as well. So we know them and they will, uh, we will <laughs> try to get them on the campaign as well. Excellent. Um, uh, another organization, uh, CAM, which is Kingston Association of Museums, and City Hall is one of the most popular museum sites during the summer. So, and I know that we, upon request, have people, uh, guides that that are bilingual. So that's definitely something you may want to look into we're, as well. We're taking note and we will contact them. Thank, Thank you. you for the, the suggestion. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Thank you for the presentation. I'm just curious about the first um, component here in um, the the greeting with the English and, and French, the bonjour, welcome. Is that something that you're recommending to all businesses or only businesses and organizations or only those who actually provide French services um, at some point? Or is it is it meant to be more of a, a welcoming campaign in a sense? It really is a welcome campaign. So the, the slogan, like it's as simple as bonjour, welcome, c'est aussi simple que bonjour, welcome. That's really the basis of the campaign. And um, you really, you, you take on the campaign however you can. So if the business can only say bonjour, welcome, then that's perfect, you know? And um, it's just about displaying what you can offer. Mm -hmm. So is, is that then mostly to do with signage or is it that staff would be greeting people with both salutations? Uh, yes, we, you can uh, with both salutations, and we have a lexicon, so to help people mm -hmm. just say a few words. So we have that in our ma promotional material, so you can have a lexicon and just learn some greetings, learn, learn some words, so you can give it to your staff also and see if, uh, if they can just be welcoming whenever they have uh, francophone clients in their business. Yeah. Yes, and one of the people that have embarked well businesses is um, Tango Nuevo, and the way that they did this was to just train their employees to say bonjour, welcome. Um, it's going to take some time to do it, right? Like, we don't expect it to happen every time, but this is about, like, little baby steps, you know? So uh, that's the way that they're participating in the campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if a business would have uh, staff, uh, bilingual staff, just one day a week, it's okay to say we provide French services only Wednesdays. It's all right, you know? So just whenever you can, whenever it's possible. Okay, seeing no other questions, merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to our second delegation this evening. Uh, Liam Carey, board chair of the Kingston Theatre Alliance, who will appear before council and speak to clause four of report number 28 received from the CAO with respect to municipal funding for the Kick and Push Festival through a service level agreement with the Kingston Theatre Alliance. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to thank uh, the mayor and council for the opportunity to speak uh, on behalf of the uh, Kingston Theatre Alliance. I've had the pleasure of being with the uh, Kingston Theatre Alliance since 2012. Um, we recognize that the uh, Kick and Push uh, Festival came out of the wishes of the council to animate uh, the Grand Theatre, and I, I, would, I would say that we've met that objective with creativity, uh, innovation, and ever greater success, both quantitatively and qualitatively. The number of uh, experiences offered, the amount of artists engaged, and the payment employment opportunities for Kingstonians has doubled and tripled over our first three years, and now we're entering year four. Um, this is a bit of a transformative moment for Kingston in terms of uh, the rage and breadth of cultural programming that is offered. There are more artists working here and artists coming from elsewhere to work here than uh, ever before. Many of the artists that were engaged uh, last year are uh, contacting us regularly to try to come back, not only those that are local, but also those who are now located elsewhere. They're excited to uh, return to Kingston. Um, and this, this elevation, um, this evolution rather, will continue in our 2018 festival that we've got planned. Um, I'm very happy to report that the Storefront Fringe is coming back to animate the downtown to give uh, emerging artists and uh, youth opportunities to showcase their work. Um, we're also in increasing our main programming stream by two, and uh, we're also, um, one thing we're really excited about is establishing a professionally run marketing campaign to market the festival across the province. We're really excited about that. Um, 
One thing that happened this week, and I'm not at liberty to say what's going on, but a uh, major provincial body has just, uh, will be announcing, we've got a major uh, bunch of support to market the festival across the province and all the major markets. That's breaking later on this week and we're, in, we're static about that. So that's really, really exciting. Um, the other thing I wanted to stress, because there is only five minutes, is that uh, we're really proud of the festival in terms of the continuum of development that we'd offer. We have the camps for the children. We have uh, paid opportunities for youth to make a living wage working in the art sector in Kingston, learning from professionals. We have the storefront fringe for emerging artists, and now we have an ever greater amount of professional opportunities for uh, professional artists and emerging artists to perform and create in our city. Um, and that's sort of the last, uh, the last, the last thing I'd like to say. Um, if council chooses to in, uh, go through with what uh, is being proposed, um, it's really going to help the Kingston Theatre Alliance not only to promote the festival, but also to keep promoting Kingston as a place uh, for innovation within the cultural sector, for the development of new work that can be exported elsewhere in the province. And we're incredibly, incredibly excited about that. On a personal note, I came to Queens and I stayed in Kingston. I've been lucky enough to create work here that's been exported to other major markets in Canada and uh, internationally in one case. Um, and I want to create other opportunities for people like me to work and grow and innovate in the city that we love so much. Um, that couldn't be done without collaboration. Besides the city, I'd like to give a brief shout out to uh, our many, many wonderful organizational partners, the Great Waterway, the Kingston Accommodation Partners, Downtown Kingston, the BIA, the Dance School of Music and Drama. All these organizations and many more have come on board to help make us a success and we're really, really grateful for them. Um, it takes a great deal of collaboration, generosity, and vision to build something like this, and I want to thank Council for your support thus far. I'm hoping it's something that you can uh, renew, and, uh, and just thank you for all that you've done. It takes a great deal of vision to uh, grow something truly magical, and uh, I feel like we're continuing to do so. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we will uh, move on. We have no further delegations, but we do have one briefing. Lainey Hurdle, Commissioner of Community Services, will provide introductory remarks and introduce Rob Kawamoto, Executive Director of Kingston Tourism, and Megan Nod, Executive Director of Kingston Accommodation Partners, who will brief Council with respect to Clause 1, Report Number 29 from the CAO in relation to the Municipal Accommodation Tax. Thank you, Mr. Mayor uh, and uh, members of Council. I'm pleased to be here tonight to provide you with a brief overview, overview of the proposed municipal accommodation tax. I'm joined by Rob Kawamoto from uh, Kingston, um, sorry, uh, Tourism Kingston, and Megan Knott from Kingston Accommodations Partner, who will also um, say a few words in terms of the implication of this uh, potential municipal accommodation tax. I have the exciting part of the presentation, which is to cover some of the legislation that I know you all want to hear about. So um, at a high level, in 2017, the province actually uh, passed some legislation to provide municipalities with the authority and ability to implement a municipal accommodation tax. This particular tax, should council decide to move in that direction, is actually a mandatory tax. It's not a voluntary tax. It does apply to hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, as well as other accommodations such as Airbnbs. Uh, and municipalities have the option to decide whether or not they want to apply it to all of these different types of accommodations. It does not apply to institutions. Um, so for example, Queen's University and St. Lawrence College have residences. Those would not uh, fall under this municipal accommodation tax. Those particular institutions could choose to continue to partner as they have been with the Kingston Accommodation Partners and, and leverage a voluntary uh, fee on their, uh, on their rooms if they choose to do so. One very important point, I know there's, I think, a little bit of confusion in, I know I've heard some comments and questions in the community. The tax is actually applicable to the visitor and not to the actual business. So when the visitor books a hotel room, it would be a tax that would be applicable to that fee, the hotel room fee, and it's not paid by the actual hotel or motel itself. We have done some research in terms of other municipalities and how they're dealing with this particular tax. Um, so far, when I actually uh, worked on the report, 
we, um, we were aware of two municipalities in Ontario that had approved moving forward with a municipal accommodation tax. Those were Ottawa and Mississauga. And we know that London, Toronto, and Niagara Falls are currently considering uh, moving in that direction as well. And all of them, one thing that was common across all of them is that they were all looking at 4% in terms of municipal accommodation tax. For municipalities that have had a destination marketing program in their community in the past, the legislation will require that should that municipality implement a municipal accommodation tax, that the revenues from that tax be shared with the existing destination marketing program. In the case of Kingston, that's the uh, that's CAP, the Kingston Accommodation Partners. So a little bit of the Kingston context and how this municipal accommodation tax would apply in Kingston. So as most of you probably already know, the Kingston Accommodation Partners have been collecting a voluntary 3% hotel fee uh, since uh, about 2004. Uh, not all hotels and motels are currently uh, involved in this program, but a large number of them are already participating in this program. If council was to move ahead with a municipal accommodation tax, this 3% hotel fee would no longer exist on obviously hotels and motels because it would be replaced by the 4% municipal accommodation tax. The only area that CAP could continue to have a partnership would be the institutions, as I mentioned earlier, Queens and St. Lawrence, as well as some of the other businesses like restaurants. To give council a little bit of a, an idea in terms of revenues that are being collected, in 2017, CAP collected about $1.7 million from the 3% voluntary fee. Um, and it's important to note that, um, that with an increase to 4%, and if we were to add all the rooms that are currently not participating, so all the hotels and motels that are currently not participating, we estimate that we could leverage about $3.2 million in, in total revenue. I wanna be clear that all of that money needs to be reinvested in tourism promotion or tourism development. It cannot be used to renovate roads, for example. So the, one of the key thing is if the city was able to leverage 3.2 million. There would be 1.7 million of those dollars that would have to be redirected to CAP as per the legislation. CAP would, of course, utilize that for tourism promotion and development, and the city would have an agreement in place to, uh, to enable that. What, um, what is left to be considered, so the reason why we're in front of you tonight is we're looking for some direction from council in terms of this particular municipal accommodation tax. We are proposing an endorsement in principle of the 4%, and what that will do is it will give us the direction to then work with our key stakeholders, like Tourism Kingston and CAP, to look at how do we then uh, put together a redistribution model for those additional dollars that we would be able to leverage, which all have to be reinvested in tourism. Uh, because right now we don't have anything in, in place that really speaks to how collectively as a community we would utilize those funds. I know the staff report talks about there are different options. We could look at obviously increasing uh, budget for tourism promotion. We could look at setting up a reserve fund that we could utilize when we're trying to attract major events to come to the city. So there are a number of things that we could contemplate doing. But what we want to make sure is that we work with our key stakeholders to put together a model and, and bring that back to council. We are also recommending that we consider accommodation such as Airbnb as a second phase to um, this potential municipal um, accommodation tax. And the reason for that is because they're a little bit more challenging in terms of being able to, to monitor. So we want to make sure that we have a robust process in place before we, uh, we move forward to implement that. So I will leave it at that. That covers generally what, what's in your report from a staff perspective, and I'll pass it over to, uh, to Rob and Megan to add some comments. Great. Thank you, Megan. And... Uh... And Annie, <laughs> Lanny, sorry. Uh, this is uh, such a great opportunity for us. It's very rare that the province gives municipalities 
uh, the ability to collect tax. Uh, and this is a, an opportunity that's come across our province over the last little while where we have an opportunity to grow tourism in Kingston specifically. Many other municipalities, like Lanny had mentioned, are looking at that tax, including Brockville. Uh, so we want to stay relevant. We want to stay in pace with what our other destinations are doing. And we want to make sure that Kingston is at the forefront and uh, right there when we need to spend our dollars to promote our destination uh, like our competitors are. Also, we want to maintain the momentum that we've gained over the last few years with the visitkingston.ca brand. Uh, we've done a lot of hard work in the past, before my arrival in July of this, last year, uh, developing a great brand for our city and for our businesses, for visitors to come worldwide. We want to expand that. We want to grow it. In order to do that, with these additional dollars, we can apply those dollars to that promotion and product development that we're going to be talking about. So I think it's very important that we consider this and like Lanny says in the report says, it's, a, it's an endorsement for, uh, in principle, talking about how we can work together. And I know working with Megan uh, over the last little while and the, Cap the uh, Kingston Accommodation Partners and Tourism Kingston as two different organizations, we realize and I think we all realize that here's a great opportunity for us to collaborate, work with the city, work with our tourism partners, work with our destination stakeholders together to really take Kingston to the next level when it comes to destination marketing promotion. <clears throat> We've got a lot of things that are coming with the Briar. There are gonna be other events like that, I'm sure. These dollars can help uh, bring those kinds of groups here. Cruise ships and deep dock water situations and the boat, all the different uh, businesses that are coming to the city. We wanna make sure we have funding to be able to support those businesses so we can grow the economy and tourism and bring that visitor economy here. This is a great opportunity for us to do that. And I hope that we can move forward and start putting together this model that works for Kingston. Megan? Okay, and that's all I'll say if you like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition, I guess, to Lanny and Rob's comments, what I'll say is that, uh, yes, yeah, since 2016, we've built a brand that's unified. We've built a brand that you'll continue to see time and time again in different places and spaces. Um, imagery is flattery or whatever that term is. And it's really interesting, even the Kingston sign that I was up here less than a year ago talking to you about, we've had several calls from other municipalities wanting to copy our sign, to which I say no. But essentially, you know, we've done some great partnerships with the city, Tourism, Kingston and CAP. Another one is the Makers brand. Um, cultural services has been an amazing partner to work with and our makers and creators in the city have elevated our brand to the next level. It's really interesting that Ottawa Tourism is now dipping their toe and essentially copying our brand. Um, and so that's kind of flattery to us, but our pooled resources need to be bigger because our major markets that you should realize we compete in are very expensive media markets. So Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal are not cheap to buy media in. And these other municipalities that are already in the 4% MAT tax game, they're way ahead of us because their pool of fund resources to buy media and be in market is that much more. And so I'll leave you with that. And then if there's any questions, we'll tag team. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, and thank you for the... Uh, I was interested by the statistic of, from what Lanny was, or Commissioner Hurdle was saying about the 3.2 million potential tax amount uh, at current levels, and I'm sort of reminded of uh, something that actually Brent Todderin says about traffic: is that you don't plan for necessarily the traffic that you have in in it going in a place. You plan for what it could be with the right infrastructure. So the question is. With this in place, is that um, 3.2 million, 4%, 3.2 million is 4% of 80 million. So that, I'm taking that as the sort of estimated total uh, hotel and motel revenues for a year that we're at right now. The question is, is that number potentially much higher if this kind of thing is successful? So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, yes, it could be higher than than uh, 3.2 uh, 3.2 million. Sorry, and um, one of important point is in that number of 3.2. 
we didn't include any of the Airbnb or other type of accommodations uh, because those are, like I said, a little bit more challenging. So we looked specifically at hotels, motels, bed and breakfast. But yes, it could be more than that. That's great to Airbnb because that was my next question. Uh, so uh, I understand it from reading what's happening in other municipalities. It's difficult to herd the Airbnbs uh, on board with something like this, uh, but a mandatory tax is a mandatory tax. It would be an enforcement issue, but potentially then what you're saying is that 3.2 million out of the 80 million business could be actually quite a bit bigger if Airbnbs were captured. Uh, and if the amount of accommodation needed to uh, host all the visitors grew as well. So we could be looking at, uh, at a, a budget that starts at 3.2 million, but could potentially go much higher. I guess that's, you're, I see you nodding, but if you want to add anything. Through Mayor, that, that is correct, that uh, Airbnbs are a little bit more challenging in terms of process to work with, and that's why we're, we're hoping that um, when we come back as a phase two, we have a much stronger process to be able to work through the Airbnbs. Okay, next on my list is Councillor Neal. Thank you. Presentation. At the film festival this weekend, I had an interesting chat with a woman who owns, uh, she and her partner own a major hotel here. And there is clearly a desire, she had no issues with the 4%. Uh, there is a desire that there be a level playing field. Just like with Uber and the taxi industry, we shouldn't be uh, allowing a competitor, a major competitor, to not have to uh, uh, give the same uh, percentage. So, and I know that'll be a challenge, but I Question. think you're you're Question. up to the challenge. So, uh, and I understand that will be phased in. Uh, it won't happen immediately. So, through you, Mr. Sure. Mayor. Um, First of all, tonight, the only thing we're asking for is endorsement principle. The, the municipal accommodation tax is not going to start rolling out right away. We need to put together, really, the implementation plan, the details, and bring that back to council with a bylaw that would then make it effective. But yes, you're correct in terms of the, the other accommodations like Airbnb. We, I know we're working on a potential licensing um, program as well for Airbnb, so if there's a potential to connect the two together, we would like to do that. So I, we're trying to make sure that we're working collaboratively and, and move, move those two processes at the same time. Great. You anticipated my next question, but I do have one more. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious, uh, the finances of it, and, and I know it's a work in progress, so there may not be a definitive answer to this question yet, but would this be something where uh, there would be a service contract between CAP and the uh, Tourism Kingston and the city, and the city might be the banker for uh, these funds and then flow it to uh, the organized partner organizations. I'm just curious how it, whether it would work like the BIA funding works. So through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the only thing that I, I can say right now is that for the, the funds that we know that we would have to redirect to CAP under the legislation, we would have to have an agreement in place between the city and CAP. Anything above and beyond that, that's the part that we're asking council for direction to actually go away and work with the st key stakeholders to figure out how that funding would be redistributed. And what we want to do at the end of the day is really maximize the dollars that we have to be reinvested in, in tourism promotion. It's great, thank you very much. Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Chef. Um, my question is, is that for the 763 hotels that haven't been paying the 3% voluntary tax, um, did they get a heads up at all that this was coming to council or did they basically find out about it a few days ago when it hit the media and the council package was brought here? 
So I, I can tell that a little bit. So each um, accommodation, no big, big, small, or otherwise, uh, is tied into an industry council partnership. So our industry that we look to is called TIO, Tourism Industry of Ontario. And so they have been talking about this for a very long time. Uh, we on visitkingston.ca created a landing page about it. So it's an FAQ landing page that we sent out to all tourism partners, not just CAP partners. So we have dipped our toe in the education piece of making sure all people, all sectors within Kingston know about it, accommodations and beyond. So we were proactive. Now the next part is depending on your, your sort of answer and go forwards tonight, is to now do face-to-face uh, -face consultations. Yeah. Thank you. Just one further, would that be one-on-one -on -one or is that gonna be a big meeting? Through Mr. Mayor, we, ha we haven't determined yet the format that, uh, that we're going to use in terms of the uh, conversation with those hotels, motels, and bed and breakfast, but we will have further discussion, um, and we want to make sure that they're also clear in terms of how the, the municipal accommodation tax works and that it's not necessarily a tax that's on to their business, but rather to the visitors. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Um, whenever we increase taxes, we automatically reduce the demand for the whatever is being taxed. But at the same time that we advertise, we raise the, the, the expectation that people will increase the demand. How confident are you that um, the increase from advertising is actually going to overcome the decrease from increasing the price of uh, stay in Kingston? So through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think Ultimately, the goal is to be able to have a larger pool of money that is not being paid by the local taxpayers or the local businesses that we can utilize and reinvest in the tourism industry. So tourism promotion is one area that we can reinvest, but so is tourism development. And, and I think Rob spoke to uh, product development. So product development could be uh, things like uh, deep water dock. So those kinds of things that we will collectively have the ability to make those decisions as a community to reinvest those dollars that again are not going to be dollars being paid by our local taxpayers and our local businesses. So it sounds like confidence is high? Yes. Yes. And um, <laughs> just in case something happens, say, are you going to be monitoring this over the next 10 years? Because if everybody around us gets 4%, we might be better off if we have three and a half or three and three quarters. Through you. Um, so we will be obviously monitoring and we will be reporting to council uh, what we would most likely propose is a yearly report to council in terms of obviously how those dollars are being uh, reassigned and reallocated. We will be monitoring surrounding communities and, and, um, and looking at what they're doing, as well as major um, tourism um, cities. So for example, Toronto and Ottawa, we know, uh, attract a large number of tourists. So we will also be monitoring their success and how things are going. Thank you. Councillor Hodges. I just want to cut something. Being, um, taking in 3% over the uh, numbers of years. So my first, my question is, did they take that money in themselves and was the city involved in that originally? And I'm just asking about the mechanics here and who was responsible. Yep. And then I have a follow-up question. Sure. So CAPS, a, a not-for-profit organization that's run by a board of governors with a specific set of bylaws. There's two people that work for the organization, myself and my colleague. And since 2004, yes, we've um, managed a tourism fund and we've worked in association with the city, but we're a separate entity completely financially responsible within our business. You took in the money and you dispersed it accordingly in... Uh well, I know it was in with, with some partnership with the uh, with Kedco. So my question is now: Is the city going to be more involved? Are we? Is the city going to be involved in actually collecting and managing this money now? And if so, is that a cost center? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the 
occur. We've, and again, this is high-level conversations that we've had between the three partners, but what we are looking at, it would be that the city would be doing the collection of the municipal accommodation tax because it would be a mandatory tax, so it does change a little bit, obviously, the nature of, uh, of the fee. And based on that, um, there's definitely a portion that we know needs to be redirected to CAP as per the legislation. And the additional funds, we haven't determined yet how those would be reallocated, but that's where we're asking council tonight for direction to have further discussion with those key, key stakeholders so we can bring back that Im detailed implementation plan. So the, the question, the, I think the obvious question, next question is, Will the city be reimbursed for its costs in doing that work for the tourism, the various small T tourism partners that are involved? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So we, we don't even know yet how much time and, and effort is gonna be required to do this. And I'm looking at the city treasurer because I've had some initial conversations with her, but we haven't detailed out um, the time and effort that would be required for that. So the answer right now is I don't know, and that's exactly what we would be reporting back on in the implementation plan. Thank you. Councillor Turner. And through you, Mayor Patterson, um, the report, and I, I'm really excited about this, and I think this is a great addition to the city. Um, having this amount of money coming in as a revenue, um, I welcome this, and I look forward to this report going through very quickly. So my question is time and place. So not to put any pressure on you, but the sooner the better if we can get this money to generate money into our tourism and our CAP program would be fabulous for the city and to keep our, our, our growth growing in tourism. So if you can answer that, that would be great. If you can answer that. Mr. Mayor, uh, I don't have an answer on that. I know that uh, obviously we will need to have those conversations with uh, the accommodations that have not been part in the past of the voluntary fund. We will want to make sure we reach out to them. Um, and we also need to have some additional discussions with the stakeholders in terms of how do we set up the, or what, how do we redistribute the additional funds and who oversees them and to Councillor Hutchison's question, how does the internal processes work? So all of that needs to be detailed out. I don't have a time frame, but we will work through and, and ideally we, I would like to see something obviously before the end of the year, come back to council with all those details. Thank you very much. Mr. Shell. Thank you. I'm equally um, moving forward. And just to sort of um, build on that, the bit that says that staff work with stakeholders to review reinvestment options, I think Megan could probably respond to this, that when CAP was formed, you probably had quite a group of people that had to come together to work out how you were going to spend the money. So I presume that that's what this is about. If we pass this and we do get a new tax, you'll have quite a new group of people that hadn't been part of CAP that will need to then be folded in. And that, is that part of the, the major process that you see will will take the time? Yeah, yes, um, absolutely. We'll, uh, we already have a really great um, composition, if you will, of let's say our CAP marketing program. So we have city staff, DBIA staff, in fact they chair our marketing committee, cultural services staff, um, CAP partners and non-CAP partners, uh, as in um, private business sort of uh, operators that are around the table, as well as attraction operators. So that is just a snapshot of the kind of people that sit around and figure out the marketing uh, opportunities for visitkingston.ca every single month. And so we'll just continue to work uh, with that model, um, with all our attraction partners and accommodation partners, so that everyone's brought into the fold and everyone uh, can work towards common goals every year with our business plan and our marketing plan and, and Tourism Kingston right by our side, if that's helpful. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Okay, so moving on, uh, do we have any petitions to present this evening? Seeing none, we do have one motion of condolence, uh, moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to Lori Sargent, administrative assistant to the city clerk, on the recent passing of her mother, Joan Sargent. 
Our thoughts are with Lori and her family during this difficult time. So we will call the vote, please. And that carries. Uh, we have no deferred motions, so we will move on to reports. First up, we have report number 28 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Baum, seconded by Councillor George, that report number 28 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. Okay, so there are, there are eight clauses. We will need to separate clause three uh, to fill in the names. Are there any other separations, Councillor Neal? Okay, so right now two and three. Councillor Holland? Six, please. Councillor Stroud. Thank you. Okay, so first we will vote on the, uh, the balance of the clauses. So clause one is amending agreement for the provision of a vote tabulation system, tabulators, and internet voting for the 2018 municipal election. Clause four, municipal funding for the kick and push festival through a service level agreement with the Kingston Theater Alliance. Clause five, award of contract for standard print advertising rates. And Clause 8, Ontario Municipal Commuter Cycling Program Enabling Bylaw and Transfer Payment Agreement. Please vote. And that carries. Clause two, proposed amendments to bylaw number 2014-16, a bylaw to regulate election signs in the city of Kingston. Councillor Neal. Yes, yeah, so I'll make this very, I had an opportunity to talk to the K. Okay. There was some confusion in the last election uh, with the idea that perhaps our sign restriction restrictions applied to window signs as well. And there were some rebellious uh, constituents who were putting signs in their window saying, I dare you to tell me I can't put a sign in my window. And uh, I just wanted to clarify with the clerk as I think I read the, the amendment that this will apply only to lawn signs. Is that accurate? Mr. Clerk? Mr. Mayor, uh, that is correct. We are not regulating signs uh, inside people's homes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to make sure that I violate the sign bylaw. So one of the big changes, right, is that we can't put out signs now until 30 days um, till the election. So if the election's October 22nd, basically no signs go up until Sunday, September 23rd. Is that the right interpretation? It's second, and yes, Your Thank you. Councillor Hutchison. I express a view. <laughs> because I was going to ask about the window signs as well. And I cannot see the difference between a window sign supposedly exempted under private property showing out onto a public street and a lawn sign on private property showing out onto a public street. Um, it seems to me they're serving the same purpose. So... Um, I don't know why we would allow that exemption. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me in principle. And so I'm just wondering if there's more of an explanation than is found in the uh, report that I saw anyway. Mr. Clark. Sure, Mr. Mayor, it is tradition signs on the exterior of the property. Um, we have done our canvassing with our uh, other clerks in other municipalities. That is something that they are allowing as well. Um, the signs within the property, the house itself, that's where we're not uh, trespassing on. Let's put it that way. So I didn't quite catch that. Last. That's where we are. We are not regulating signage within the residence. We're not getting into the homes of people with respect to uh, where the signs would be erected. Uh, signs are permitted on the lawns, as they are in other municipalities as well. It's a long-standing tradition. So as Mr. Holland just said to me, the question is whether it's a personal space or not, right? 
It's still advertising. Let's not kid ourselves, okay? <laughs> It's rhetorical, I'm assuming. Pardon? That's the rhetorical last bit was comment. rhetorical. Yeah. Yeah. Katz Rosterhoff. Uh, Mayor. Um, so just to be clear, lawn signs are not um, part of this. Then it's what's it's the signage that's on the side of the roads and, and that kind of thing. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it refers to signage. All elections, election signage, thank you. Um, the part that I'm struggling with, and I really wish I had uh, brought this up sooner, was um, you know, within the urban area, I can see four days being enough, but um, I, I would have liked to have asked for a seven days to remain for the rural area because of the, the, the sheer size of it. Uh, having just gone through it, uh, it was, I mean, we were dedicated to it, but uh, it, it, it would be quite a task, uh, four days. Uh, for the rural area. I don't know if that's... Through Mr. Mr. Mayor, um, the response to that comment is that in order to maintain consistency throughout the community, it's important that we have a standard uh, date within uh, the bylaw. There are other municipalities that are more rural than we are, and they're down to two days to get the signs done after the election. So four seems to be a, a compromise that we mm. believe will work. And it hasn't been a problem in Kingston. It's very rare that we have to go and charge anybody or take the signs down after the election. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, we will call the vote on Clause 2. And that carries. Clause three, service level agreement with the Kingston Arts Council and council participation in the 2018 City of Kingston Arts Fund. So uh, we're looking for two councillors uh, to participate in the juries for the review could, committees. Could I? Uh, Councillor Neal? If I could point something out. Um, these are exactly the same dates as the FCM uh, conference. And at least two of us, and perhaps more, are going to FCM. And I dare say we're people who frequently volunteer for these committees. So uh, are we locked into those specific dates? Uh, I'm looking to our, our cultural director. Mr. Wigginton. Through you, Your Worship, um, these were the dates that were selected by the Kingston Arts Council. They've made a significant change this year to having these meetings during the week. Um, you know, if it's desired, we could try and go back and, and work with them, but if I, it'd be ideal if we could make these dates work as they've already been established. Okay, so I think that uh, what we will do is do a first try at this with the dates as proposed. Do I have a volunteer? Do I have two volunteers? Councillor Shell? Um, yes, for the uh, review for the uh, project grants. Okay. The other one's my yes. mother's birthday. So, so I need one councillor for the review committee for grants and one councillor for uh, the project grants. So Councillor Shell, you are volunteering to be the councillor for the project grants review committee. Can I have another volunteer for the uh, operating grants review? Councillor Hodgson? Uh, probably, but when in the day is this going to be done? Mr. Wigginton? To you, your Washington Arts Council has scheduled these meetings to take place between 9.30 and 12.30 p.m. Please. Good. Okay, so unless there's anybody else that is itching to volunteer, we will uh, confirm uh, Councillor Hutchison on the Operating Grants Review Committee and Councillor Shell on the Project Grants Review Committee. Okay, so with that, we will call the vote then on Clause 3. And that carries. Clause 6, Bonjour, Welcome Campaign. Councillor Holland. I'm very excited to see this... Uh proposal and to hopefully have the endorsement of all of council. Um, I guess just to give my rationale, um, we did hear from the delegation that it's important for tourism and I think we can all see that. But um, having grown up in New Brunswick, which is a bilingual province, officially bilingual, 
Um, language was very political. There was a lot of segregation between French and English. And I think this is something that is good for society as well. Uh, the benefit to having some sort of cultural awareness and recognition of our Francophone community, as well as our visitors is very important. So I'm very thrilled to see this come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Trub. Uh, I'll just say, évidemment, I will uh, support this, but I, I do have a question for um, for com for the commissioner. It is about the uh, you know the, what, 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 during the delegation we heard what, what this would look like. So, if uh, City Kingston staff were looking at participating in this, just have we taken a preliminary look at at what kind of uh, services we could provide? Because I understand we're quite unilingual in the services that we provide right now. And I'm wondering what, uh, what we have that we can draw, what resources we have we can draw on and what it would look like in a couple of examples would be nice. Thank you. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you and uh, through you, Mr. Yes, we, we have uh, taken a, a very high level look at what we actually currently already provide in French or we have a mandate to provide in French. So all of our social services, childcare, um, as well as housing services, we do have to provide in both languages. So that's definitely an area that we know is already available. We're not necessarily probably making it as, um, we're, we're not advertising it as much as we should, and this will help to do that. Uh, we know City Hall, um, we have uh, uh, tour guides that are also bilingual, so I think there was a comment earlier about City Hall, so that's something that we would identify. Um, the campaign refers as well to staff that are bilingual wearing some kind of pin that, that indicates they speak both languages. We have a number of staff that are bilingual, but it's not necessarily obvious, so that's something else that we could also implement quite easily without having to really change anything that we're currently doing. Thank you. Uh, yes, and you need, I guess, what happened at, at the hospital where I worked when a bilingual policy <coughs> was brought in was that they surveyed every employee and had everyone volunteer the information of what other languages they spoke, especially French. <coughs> Excuse me. So I guess we would have to do that. Um, <coughs> because you can't always tell from someone's name whether they speak French, that's for sure. Uh, so I guess the question is, would we be doing a survey across the thousands of uh, Kingston employees to identify the, those that can provide bilingual services? Commissioner Hurdle. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the, the initial steps would be to, like I indicated, those services that we already provide or have available in both languages, we would make sure there's signage that's available so it's it's very obvious to the general public that they're available in both languages. Uh, we would reach out to staff uh, and departments, especially the ones that are dealing with with the public, so the front-facing, uh, basically, uh, service providers. We would reach out to identify uh, employees that uh, do speak both languages, and we would make sure that, based on that, there's appropriate recognition or information that's uh, provided to the public. Thank you, and I plan to... Thank you, Mary Bohm. Oh, it's just Councillor Bohm now. Councillor Bohm. <laughs> okay, my mistake. Deputy Mayor Neal. Councillor Extend, Bolton. Extended my term, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, I'm obviously going to support this. I think this is a great initiative. Um, my wife is a, is a Francophone, and uh, to speak to Councillor Stroud's comment, you cannot always tell who is because one time on the phone she asked me, do you know any French? And I roll into my French immersion, and she rolls into perfect Quebecois. And I'm sitting there going, wow, you win. So we're, <laughs> we're raising our children bilingual. I think it's amazing. The, the biggest plus I see with this is actually the, the little pin that just says, je parle français. And that, that's huge because sometimes you're just walking through the hall and two people just kind of see that and it's just that instant recognition and there's like this whole culture that exists but it's almost like hidden and I think to, to some of the other comments around here, like let's bring that into the community. So let's kind of celebrate that and also encourage other people to, half my problem is is just the confidence to actually try to speak French with somebody. And I probably know a little bit more than I think I do, but at the same time, it's just having that confidence. So encouraging the conversation and, and, and basically, you know, bonjour, welcome. It's, it's great, it rolls off the tongue. So I think this is awesome. Okay, thank you very much. So we will call the vote on clause six.
and that carries. Clause seven, a word of contract, tree planting contractor. Councilor Stroud. Yes, first of all, um, Councilor Sanek actually started the ball rolling on some of these questions and she wrote a detailed email to public works staff, uh, to uh, Director Wells, and he answered them. He was very thorough. He gave many answers to her questions by email. Um, there's so many questions and so many answers that it wouldn't actually be practical to go through all of them here tonight, but I wanted to just uh, mention one or two, just read out what, I don't see him here tonight, so I'm just gonna read out what the answer was given, and then I have a question that, for staff, hopefully someone here will be able to answer that. Um, so, for example, the obvious question that she asked was whether the uh, contract that's in the RFP includes the cost of the trees themselves or is it just the cost for planting? That's the very first question any landscaper would ask as well. Uh, and the answer was no, it was just for the planting. The cost of the trees is a separate RFP, um, which provides us more control was the explanation. So, okay, so uh, that's one of the questions and answers. And then another one that I thought was noteworthy was uh, the, how many trees are being planted in the spring? So the, from Councillor Sanek, are 500 trees being planted in the spring? And of course, that question is motivated by the, uh, the obvious reason is because when you plant in the spring before the summer, and they're young trees, they dry out in the summer and many of them don't survive as Councillor Sanek has brought up many times uh, in the past about Bath Road and places like that where uh, young trees were not, did not survive the first summer. So anyway, the answer was uh, 500 trees in the spring and all, all, they will all be planted by Drake, by the contractor. So, uh, but the, the bigger picture I guess was a thousand trees 500 of which get planted in the spring, and the reason for that is because you don't have time to plant 1,000 all in the fall. So then my last question uh, came from a member of the community who uh, also happens to be a landscaper and who did not notice the, uh, the RFP when it came out, but he took a look at it uh, when this came up, and he says uh, that he read through the reporting on the city website that said that there were 18 people that took, or for different firms, landscaping firms and so on, that took the RFP paperwork, but only, we only see one uh, application and it's from Drake, who is the successful applicant uh, being recommended by staff. And so that's my question. Why, do we know why we only have one response if 18 firms took the paperwork? Do we have any idea? Ms. Kidd? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the all city RFPs are posted on a, a bid site and uh, they're available. We can see how many times uh, any particular RFP is downloaded. We can see who downloaded it, but we have no information available to us as to why someone downloaded it and then chose not to submit a response. And that's that's with all RFPs that are issued. Okay, so I guess there for us, we have to decide, uh, and the, the obvious question is, do we go with the one applicant at the price that they've bid, or do we think that we need a competitive process? Uh, that's the obvious question when you get an RFP with only one bidder. Um, now, we do have something to compare it to. We, have, we can compare it to last year's work. Uh, the scope size is similar. They did com complete last year's work successfully. There, there is a watering component included, which was another question from Councilor Sanic that was confirmed by Director Wells. Drake, drakes are required to water the newly planted trees as specified in the planting contract. So it's contracted. It's part of the contract. So, um, and that's especially important for the spring planting. So the question is, is there another company out there that might be able to do a better job or a cheaper job or, or, or beat this RFP had they applied? But we know that 18 took the paperwork. So I'm, I'm left with the advice of my friend who's a landscaper guessing that perhaps it, it's tough to come in at this number and still do it successfully with the size of the, and to have the manpower available to do this size contract. And maybe these landscapers have a lot of things going on and they can't free up enough manpower. But uh, that's just a guess. And really, ideally, we would want a competition in the future. Uh, it's not healthy to have just one supplier with no competition. So 
Uh, I'm tempted to move deferral, but uh, I'm not going to, and I'd like to see if anyone else has anything to say. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councilor Sanek. Um, thank you, Your Worship. That is a concern. Um, this contract also, or this, what we're going to approve tonight, it also gives the option of extending their contract into 2019. So for whoever's around the horseshoe in 2020, when this contract comes up again, then maybe we can ask, I don't know uh, if this right now is February, February, March, maybe we should be asking in September for the 2020 contract, um, you know, what, what parts of the RFP or, or what, what parts are going to be in that RFP. Um, the good part about what I heard from our director of public works is that they really have a good tree watering plan. After Drake does the initial watering in the spring, then our public works staff take over the watering for the rest of the time. And uh, that's something that's really important. So I'll approve this tonight. Thank you. Councilor Hodgson. Thank you, Your Word. Um, I thank the Stroud for bringing this up. And and also the comments of Councillor Rosanic. I note that, um, that Drake's got a total score of 88. I would think it would be very difficult to do that unless the price was a price that staff thought was reasonable based on experience. Would that be a reasonable surmise? Ms. Kidd? Through you, Mr. Nesson, as the report indicates, the price that was submitted by Drake was within the expected price range that was budgeted for the program. So I, I understand that, that the price is reasonable in accordance with the work uh, that was ex that's expected to be done. Thank you, and I understood it'd be 500 spring and another 500 in the fall. Is that correct? Mr. Mayor, uh, 500 in the spring and more like 1,000 in the fall uh, for a total of, of 1,500. Um, the 500 in the spring um, are the amount that, that the Public Works Department felt that they could comfortably manage, not knowing what the summer uh, weather conditions were going to be if we had a drought like we had in 2016, and uh, a comfort level that they could manage the watering program and the monitoring program because fall is, is definitely the ideal time to, to do the planting. So um, there will actually be in excess of 1,500 trees planted. This will cover the emerald ash borer replacement program, some of our, our normal replacement trees, and, uh, and then the contribution to the double the tree canopy uh, program target for this year. Thank you. Perhaps that goes somewhat answering the question about whether it's a worthwhile bid. Thank you. Thank you. So we will call the vote. And that carries. Okay, moving on to report number 29 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, that report number 29 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted. Okay, so there's just the one clause, municipal tax accommodation. We'll call the vote. And that carries. Report number 30 from Planning Committee. Pleasure. Report number 30 from the Planning Committee. Duly moved and seconded. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Turner, that report number 30 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Okay, there are three clauses. If no one like any of them separated, we'll vote on them as a whole. Clause one is approval of an application for an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, 1201 McAdoo's Lane. Clause two, approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment, 810 Middle Road. And clause three, approval of an application for an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, 133 Dalton Avenue. So we will call the vote.
and that carries. Report number 31 from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee. Thank you. I had lost momentarily. Uh, uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Holland. Thank you. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Holland, that report number 31 from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there's just the uh, one clause, appointment of members to the built environment working group. And we'll call the vote. And that carries. Okay, report number 32 from the nominations advisory committee. Thank you, Your Worship. Please present uh Report number 32 from the Nominations Committee, moved by myself, Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Ustroff. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 32 from the Nominations Advisory Committee be received and adopted. Okay, there is just the uh, one clause that E. Jane McFarlane and Haley Smith be appointed to Heritage Kingston for a term ending November 30th, 2018. So we will call the vote. And that carries. Okay, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. We have no information reports. We have no information reports from members of council. We have one item of miscellaneous business. Uh, that the resignation of Donald Mitchell from the Built Environment Working Group of the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee be received with regret. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Schell, seconded by Councillor Bohm. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, uh, we have one new motion. It is a motion of reconsideration, moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, uh, that we reconsider the motion to defer the recommendation with respect to municipal discounts. So the rules of a recommendation uh, or a motion of reconsideration are as follows. Uh, both the mover and seconder have an opportunity to make a clear and concise statement to council as to why they wish uh, to have the motion reconsidered. So just to note that this is to reconsider the motion to defer. So I would ask both the mover and the seconder to please keep your comments related to that motion to defer rather than the motion itself. So Councilor McLaren, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, the deferral seems uh, that there doesn't seem to be a good reason for it to be deferred at this time, and here's why. The report on page six states that the, and this is a quote, that the LICO is so low that it disqualifies a large group of residents living in poverty. I believe this creates an imperative to help the people now as opposed to later. If we really want a livable city, and if we want to find, and if we find that Kingston is not a livable city for some, then this is the time to move on this, not a year and a half from now. So that's why I want to vote in favor of that today. The second reason that I see no good reason to delay this is that the seniors discount um, shouldn't be linked to a poverty reduction. Taking away the seniors discount is a form of ageism. It's universally true that no matter what their situation in life, everyone makes less money the day after they retire than the day before. So retirement is a financial hit. and. And it's getting, don't worry. So again, it, I'm, this is to the motion to yes. defer, not to the point speaking of, to municipal discounts, whether or not you agree with them or well, the, not. The point is that uh, it, uh, it's forcing ageism on us. And instead of delaying it till next year, we are committing it now. Or sorry, the reverse of that. We're committing it later as opposed to fixing it now. That's why it's a time thing. That has, that's a point I'm trying to make, so may I finish? Or, thank you. 
So it's universally true that everybody, it, it's a financial hit for all retirees. And this puts them into a class that allows increasing the discrimination. Ageism is like racism and sexism. Despite it being illegal, there are still a whole host of subtle and not so subtle aggressions, maneuvers, pressures, and discriminations suffered. And just like combating racism and sexism may require positive action, so too does the fight against ageism. Taking away age-based benef benefits, as long as these pressures to retire are still there, means so that we are Council, acting as Council oppressors. Retire. So a clear and concise statement really should be in and about a minute. You just quickly say why you want this back on the floor. I, you're going into the actual arguments of whether or not we want to go down this route, and we're not at that stage. So do you have anything else that you wish to add that speaks only to why you would want to reconsider the motion to defer. Just the conclusion. Very briefly, please. So for these reasons, I want to vote down the recommendation to take away the seniors discount today, today as opposed to in the future. And uh, there's no need to hold this over seniors' heads for the next year and a half. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison, you're the seconder. Do you have anything to add? Just briefly, um, I think that on, um, I voted for this originally. I think I'm further thought responding to express concerns of seniors and those who favor the higher limb that this is a question of principle. The deferral asks about details or quantities. I think it's clear from the report, if you read it carefully, that the quantities are clear enough. There, are, there would be disqualified approximately around 15,000 seniors. And I don't think that's acceptable. And the limb would uh, increase the number of people who are covered, and I think both are f would be fair and, and equitable and doable, affordable. So the only way we can get to that question is by reconsidering this motion. Okay. So the motion to reconsider uh, is on the floor. We will vote. It takes two-thirds to pass. So we will call the question, please. Please vote. And that loses by a vote of four to eight. Okay, are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk Ross, for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2018-8, held Tuesday, February 20th, 2018, be confirmed. Please vote. One more, please. And that carries. Uh, we have some tabling of documents and number of communications. Is there any other business? Mr. Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Turner, that bylaws 1 through 10 and 14 be given their first and second reading. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Turner, that Clause 11.34 of bylaw number 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaw 2 three readings. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Turner, that bylaws 2 through 14 be given their third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal. 
Please vote. And that carries. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.